about was um, what she learned in going to the Training Institute for Dissemination and Imitation Research at NIH. Have any of you heard of this? Or have any of you been to it? Okay. Um, well, you know, when she returned, you know, hit her up for more detail. But what you do basically, this is a yearly event that happens in August in the last couple of years. We believe it's going to happen again this year. And what you do is you apply with a one pager about a, uh, a research project that you'd like to get funding for. And they give you very specific instructions about DNI, but they also um, give you specific advice about your proposal and how to sell it. So it's, it's a wonderful session. It is competitive. You have to, you know, apply and get in, and then they pay you away. So it's, it's pretty neat. Um, so the beginning part of this, I'm going to, I'm going to give an, a little bit of an overview of what of NIH's focus on dissemination implementation. And we have, in other sessions, touched on some of this, um, but this is the, the NIH uh, vision about the field. So this slide is a takeoff on the Zen saying that the tree falls in force and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? If an intervention works and nobody can use it, can it have an impact? Many of you are very aware of this uh, set of data. This is probably the best estimate of how long it takes for discovery to make it into practice. And, um, the estimate is that it takes 17 years, on average, for 14% of research to be implemented in practice. The implication there is that the vast majority of what we discover, even if it works, is never implemented. So this, you know, why is that? Well, one, one of the reasons is because of the way we've uh, organized our academic research uh, careers and uh, the lack of coordination between does this work? No. Okay. Between practices at the end and priorities for research funding. There's not a lot of communication going on there. So first of all, you start off on the left with priorities for research funding, which may have very little relevance to practice. Um, and then there's a long uh, period of time during which time you ha you move a lot of, um, essentially you lose a lot in the pipeline. So our careers uh, are based on getting grants, and those grants take years to get, uh, writing publications that are peer reviewed, and that takes years. Um, then when, once you have a publication, it is either picked up or not picked up by evidence-based medicine um, people interested in evidence-based medicine, there's some synthesis of the research eventually leading to guidelines and maybe leading to practice. But all of that is really um, modified by the, the factors under practice, like funding, population needs, demands, work, the practice circumstances, et cetera. And the biggest uh, problem is that there's very little communication between the two ends of these pipelines. This is a quote from Louis Pasteur. To him and her who devotes his life to science, nothing can give more happiness than increasing the number of discoveries. But his or her cup of joy is full when the results of his or her studies immediately find practical applications. How many of you have done a research where you felt like there were immediate practical applications? It's rare. It's very rare. And, and shortening the time period and the connection between uh, research in practice is one of NIH's, uh, the DNI section of NIH's major focuses. <laughs> okay, so one of the problems is that at NIH anyway, we focus, they have focused, I should say, almost exclusively on internal validity. Very little on external validity. So when you're in a study section at NIH, it's all about is this valid science, are the, are the methods going to give you internally valid results? Um, very much less focus on is it important and very little focus on is it useful. 
So that's because of the high, focus on high internal validity and low external validity, a lot of the research we're doing has very diminished relevance for practitioners. So this is um, what has been coined the dissemination dilemma. The research establishment pushes us towards effective, internally valid interventions that may be worthless to practitioners. Practitioners who really are the experts in their environment and the intended users uh, don't have the resources or necessarily the experience to translate their homegrown, externally valid interventions into evidence-based interventions. So this dichotomy um, is really a big part of the problem. Um, yeah, okay. So there are three conceptualizations about how to deal with this gap between research and practice. Number one, practitioners need to receive the lessons of research and put them into practice. That's one concept. Number two, some people conceive that of research and practice as entirely separate disciplines that each must develop their own answers to their own problems. Um, I would maintain that number three, um, where research and practice have complementary perspectives and skills that need to be used together to address the real need, which is collaborative knowledge production, is where we need to go in terms of um, really fulfilling the promise of dissemination implementation science. So in D&I research, we need evidence that is more contextual. In other words, it matters a whole lot where you're implementing. It's practical, it's robust, and it's comprehensive. And we need to move much, uh, we, we need less focus on the type of isolated science we've been doing with singular settings that are usually not, um, that are often ideal and not very real. So rigorous, relevant, and practical. Okay, so let's, let's go through some definitions, and we've talked about some of these, but I just want to make sure everybody here is on the same page. Dissemination is the targeted, these are NIH definitions. Is the targeted distribution of information and intervention materials to a specific public health or clinical practice audience. So this, the intent of dissemination is to spread knowledge and the associated evidence-based intervention. Um, it's an active approach. In implementa implementation, on the other hand, is the use of strategies to adopt and integrate evidence-based health interventions and change practice patterns within specific settings. So the big difference between these two is in the scope, is in um, how, is in the focus. In implementation, you're picking a specific site and um, you are figuring out how to, how to adopt an evidence-based practice at a specific site. The focus of dissemination is much larger <laughs> over, um, generally over populations or a system. Um, so there is, uh, they differ from effectiveness research. Well, effectiveness research is really um, direct comparison. Well, it's actually seeing how something works in the real world. Um, they differ from that in that they're, both of them imply an explicit focus on understanding how things are spread, how they are adopted. Okay, so it's not just about are they effective, but how are they adopted? Um, and, and the objects of dissemination and implementation are interventions that have proven efficacy and effectiveness in the real world. Knowledge translation is a term um, for dynamic and iterative processes that include synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge. This is a term that is primarily used in Canada and much of Europe. So KT is what they call dissemination implementation. Um, translational research, which is a much broader term the CDC uses a lot, um, and obviously you've all seen the T1 through T4 that NIH put down. This is a very broad umbrella term. Um, 
and it's defined as a sequence of events in which a proven scientific discovery is successfully institu institutionalized. Um, and within this umbrella would be implementation, dissemination, and diffusion research. So a lot of time spent comparing dissemination, implementation, I really think a lot of those conversations are sort of not that helpful. I think the major thing is that the level of how of the um, focus tends to be for implementation is organization or a clinic, where, whereas for dissemination, um, it's more at the policy, media level, or population level. Okay, so um, I'm going to turn this over in just a minute to Elaine, who's going to talk a little bit more about modeling of looking at dissemination implementation from the NIH perspective. But this slide just makes the point that, that um, implementation and dissemination are very complicated processes and they depend critically on the context. So on the left is a theoretical intervention. There are parts of the intervention that are critical. There are parts that are not critical. Determining that is very important because um, on the right, it's very important the context in which you're trying to disseminate or implement and at the organizational level or delivery site, and there has to be a good fit. So in some, in some types of research, there's a lot of discussion about um, the, the degree of uh, fidelity to the intervention. From uh, NIH's the, the, the uh, BNI section at NIH's perspective, we should be focusing less on fidelity and more on fit. So there's a very conscious, um, there's a conscious approach to, to trying to, to define what are the really critical elements and how much variation can there be based on having a good fit between the intervention and a particular implementation site. Okay. The other thing that this, uh, the other point this slide is trying to make is that this is really this really needs to be a partnership where there's um, give and take between the implementation site and the implementers and researchers. And the community really should be part of this, which I think Elaine is gonna show a slide about that. Okay. Can you hear me or should I have a microphone? You're fine. Okay. Yeah. So Remembering that this um, institute was geared towards grantsmanship and readiness, right? the next set of slides is, is moving along that direction. So we've heard about the problem, the, the gap, and, and approaches. Um, I'm going to be talking about how NIH used conceptual frameworks for thinking about the design of the implementation. They give some approaches and examples, which might be the types of questions that um, are used in grant proposals. And then the last portion, we'll be talking about sources of grant funding um, and written down a little bit more to the, that practical level. So this section, um, they kicked off with a quote um, that says, all models are wrong and some are useful. So there's a caveat here as we start to um, walk through some of the conceptual frameworks in that they're frameworks. Um, and the other takeaway from this is there is not a single unifying theory, if you will, they're trying to find in quantum physics, right? Um, there's not a unifying theory either for dissemination or innovation. It's very much the context and the question and the, the behavior or knowledge that you're trying to measure. It's part of matching up the right theory to the question that you're asking. So that's the other big takeaway from this section. Um, all right, so you, you have this picture. This is a multimedia slide in which we'll, sh we'll start painting how the objective is to create a dynamic, sustainable, ongoing learning system. Right. So first we're going to talk about sort of the steps that you might think about in designing research. And where you are in those steps might vary depending on the, the question or area you're doing research in. So first of all, what is the dissemination problem? Um, what is the multi-level context? Right. So you hear a lot about this in dissemination. It's it may be patient level, it may be provider, clinic, practice level, it may be that system level, it may be community state level. 
And so understanding for what you're trying to implement or disseminate, what are those layers that are operating in your case? Um, and thinking about that in, in the design of who are you trying to influence at which level? What knowledge or evidence exists as to what might be barriers um, or what might be facilitators for the information or behaviors you're trying to implement? And from there, you do the design and evaluate and refine. So this is being very choiceful around are you doing implementation here at the policy level? You know, you'll hear sometimes implementation, you want to engineer it in, right? It's something that has to be done, right? That people don't have a choice. Is it at a practice level? Is implementation taking advantage of electronic health records, for example, and how you're operating? Or is it um, at a person, I'll add another P, at a personal level? Are you trying to get the provider and patient to be have to be implementing certain behaviors? So being very choiceful there, designing your intervention, evaluating it, and then allowing the time for refinement. So it, and then, then they have the complexity to say all these things all interrelate with one another. Um, and you can see different <coughs> questions or different methods come in at different points in time. So, um, so for instance, picking up on the theme that Allie was mentioning in terms of fidelity. In this case, it shows up in the refinement area. And the key concept um, or key elements as she said, relates to the fidelity, but it allows the other things to be adaptable. So you're trying to understand what are the core things that need to happen that should be translated on as you're moving forward versus the things that can be flexible and allow adaptation for that local setting. Right? So each one of these has a set of questions that you could think about. Um, at the consider multi-level context, that's where oftentimes there's modeling approaches that you are um, predicting how do these different um, levels interact with one another, participatory based approaches in which you might use some of the methods we discussed last month in terms of qualitative research methods and integrating it in and key informant interviews to understand context and so forth. But thinking of this as a learning loop, not just a linear um, project, would be how NIH is framing it too. So evidence from community, evidence from ideologic or anthropologic research as to what's going on in the practice, intervention evidence, and then practice-based evidence when you're taking the intervention into, into practice. Okay. So think of it as it's very much like uh, continu um, continual quality improvement. It, it's a cycle. And so they offer several theories and frameworks. Now this, again, from a grantsmanship standpoint is why, why should you have a theory in your grant application? Um, well, if you're at least trying to design your intervention based on theory, you're more likely to be effective. And there's two different types of theories that complement one another, but you, again, should be choiceful in thinking through what makes sense for your research question. There's explanatory theories in which the purpose of that theory is to understand why someone is doing the behavior that they're doing. The example they give is understanding why individuals smoke and barriers to quit. I'm looking at research that's related to diabetes and dyslipidemia screening in um, persons with serious mental illness. So I might try to understand what are the barriers and facilitators to doctors ordering labs, which might be different from barriers and facilitators to patients going to get their labs drawn. Right? Then there's change theory, which then says, well, if I'm working, uh, you know, I'm trying to understand what's the most effective method of getting the change that I'm hoping for, getting a patient to quit smoking getting a doctor to order a diabetes lab, getting a patient to go get their diabetes lab. So again, it comes back, what is the question you're trying to answer, and then choosing a theory that matches that type of question. Because essentially, you know, this is a, I love these little science quotes that they interesting in, um, in your mix. Um, so the scientist at the chalkboard and he's trying to have the steps on this equation so this is when a miracle occurs. And I think uh, you should be more explicit here in step two, right? So that's really what the theory is trying to do. It's helping us try to be more explicit of how come people aren't doing this when that's what we're trying to do. And breaking it down into components. So what theories are being used? If I'm going to write an application, what theory should I use, right? So at this institute, they did some um, sharing of reviews that they've done on successful grant applications. And the big takeaway is, as I said, there is not a single you know, science 
here. Um, they looked at um, several study reports since 2000. Um, there's a relative, and these are effectiveness trials, um, so trials in real world settings. Um, and there's a variety, some of the most common ones, if you've had any behavior change, trying to coursework already, social cognitive theory, stages of change, health belief model, theory of planned behavior, and pre C, pro C have all been used in this field. Um, there are several slides that come after this that take some of these theories and sh show it blown up. I'm, I'm not, for the sake of time, not going to go into all of that. Um, but you have the merit in my microscopic detail, but you can go online and there's references to that. If there is a particular theory, because I also wear the hat of designing future seminars, you know, one of the, uh, we had Jim Deering speak a couple of months ago, and he took the fusion theory and went in depth. If there's any of these theories that you think are most interesting or you'd like to learn more, please jot that down in the evaluations that you're doing, because then we can help design future seminars to really dig deep in, 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 into one of these. These are um, looking at dissemination, dissemination and implementation models and grants that have gone through that track at NIH over the last five years or so. Um, broken out both looking at the setting as a community public health setting, primary care, or specialty care. And as you look at the numbers across the, uh, the matrix here, you can see, again, there is no one that's used more often than others. You know, diffusion of innovation, the rename, system theory, network theory, uh, community-based participatory research, quality improvement, organizational theory, uh, and others, and many of them use multiple frameworks theories. Um, so I know Jean will say that she was hoping to go to this conference and find the magic bullet of the framework to use in all of the grants. And I think she walked away saying, well, on one hand, it's very reassuring that there isn't like a magic answer that we all may should know about. But on the other hand, it, it does, you need to give some thought as to which one to match and therefore have the right experts on your team that have knowledge of those various theories. Um, and look at other ones here too. The takeaway here is to think about theories that may not be necessarily in health. And this is actually noted in the program announcement for this set of grants to look at um, other disciplines, um, behavioral economics, um, organizational theory, diffusion, marketing kinds of theories may have approaches to the questions that they're looking at. So when I talk next month, I'm saying healthcare, but it's really very similar to social marketing um, is the theory or approach I'll be going into. So tips for thinking about how to use theory in your grant. First of all, do you have a theory? Is it well developed throughout your proposal such that your aims are linked to the theory, your research design, the variables you're collecting, the analytic strategies are all hanging together? And you get, as he says, you, you get points if you if you have a theory and framework that hangs together throughout the entire grant. Um, and he says if you think outside the box of health, you may get innovation points. So. Okay. Um, and some other general recommendations um, that come here. Researchers should evaluate the dependence. So yeah, so now we're starting to go into the area of you know, what kinds of examples of applications that they talked about in this, in this institute. So they say, talk about evaluating, for instance, the dissemination of interventions targeting different populations, um, thinking about developing and using valid measures of dissemination constructs. Um, I don't know if you, any of you have heard of the GEM measures. Have any of you heard of so, so Russ Blaskow is really the innovator behind a lot of this institute and, and the teaching that goes on here. And um, he's been leading an effort at NIH to come up with a construct of a set of variables that could be commonly measured across dissemination implementation settings, um, and they call it GEM. It, it's housed with, and we can put this picture it's on our site. Um, it's housed within um, um, National Cancer Institute because that's where he is. Um, but the idea is to say, just that we have valid measures for health outcomes, right? We think about cholesterol, we think about you know, what is a major cardiovascular event, these have been standardized. You know, the science of the foundation implementation should be also thinking of standardized measures for implementation and so forth. 
um, and focusing our work on real world relevance and using theories, therefore, to help in the planning. So the bottom line, as I said, is just pick a theory, justify why you chose that theory, and then use it throughout your proposal. Okay. So the next set of slides talk about examples and the kinds of questions that uh, might be appropriate. Um, and he kicks it off with here, you know, you might relate back to what Ali was saying in terms of the context. And there's a real opportunity here because dissemination implementation is that interface between the researcher and the practitioner, right? And um, it allows researchers to generate evidence that might lead to evidence-based intervention, and it allows practitioners to implement these and design their own intervention approaches. So there's a lot of interface that's going on between the science of the doing and the people who are practicing, and really learning from that. Um, so there's high expectations of practitioners to use the evidence-based interventions, but we know there's challenges there, that a publication in a peer-reviewed journal is not the same as having something that's easily disseminated. So many of the successful projects are ones in which you really have advisory boards that include the community that you're working with that would eventually be disseminated. So in the case of you know, the work Ali does, it's close collaboration with the um, Department of Public Health and the community of providers um, around vaccine delivery. Um, because I'm focused on the Medicaid population, I'm working closely with the, the um, Department of Mental Health for the state, who has an interest in the area, such that what we're designing is hopefully taking into account their, their on the ground learning, but also something that they can do of practical use. So, and then hopefully we get it published too, right? Um, the point of this one, this is a, a way of framing the steps in translation that NIH has talked about. I, I assume you probably have all heard the, the T0, T1, 2, 3, 4 translation steps. Oftentimes when they're presented, it's presented in a linear way. Right? I'm going to come over to <coughs> my basic science, I'm going to translate that over into the clinical science, then the clinical is going to go to the practice, and then the practice is going to go to the population policy. And the point here is if we think about knowledge transfer integration, it's really an iterative process in which we're constantly learning from the other side. So um, questions may arise um, in the translation phase that go back to, you know, testing an image, um, a promising intervention. So, um, so what are the kinds of topics? Um, here are several that are listed. A potential topic might be analysis of factors that influence the creation, or how we package, how we transmit um, health research knowledge. So research that looks at what's the most effective way to disseminate, if you will, knowledge transfer. Um, it might be research that relates to experimental studies to test the effectiveness of various dissemination strategies. All right, so um, I've seen this, for instance, uh, we want to use social media and we want to get evidence-based practice out there, which social media strategies and tactics, because it's, it's a big box of things that you can do, works best with which kinds of audiences, right? If you're trying to influence a teenager, young adult, it might be different than if it's the elder, or if it's a mom, somewhere in between with little kids, right? So there may there is research that's being funded to look at what are the right information methods um, to, to match up. Then there's uh, also studies that look at alternative strategies for service delivery systems, where you might look at does it make a difference if the practice is in a rural setting or an underserved population, what kinds of toolkits are needed there. And then studies on how target audiences are defined and evidence is packaged, as I said, for those specific target audiences. So all of these are thematic kinds of questions that have been used in dissemination research. And common dissemination strategies or interventions that are used in studies are listed here. You know, and it's wide ranging. Um, and common outcomes that might be measured in these trials are also listed here. So what's the speed of dissemination rate? What's the reach? How many people was I able to reach with this dissemination method? 
and how efficient was that? Um, what was the measurements of the adoption or uptake in the behaviors you're trying to do? Um, and then, you know, down the list, sustainability, right? So a lot can be done to really get the word out and to disseminate, but is that a short campaign that you do once, or is this a sustainable campaign that can be easily incorporated into ongoing systems for the community of the audience that you're dealing with? So how, how do you think about sort of the return of investment, if you will? Um, and, and then, then you also, ideally, you're trying to relate it back to the risk factor, the quality of life, mortality, health outcomes that we're used to um, measuring. Those are, I think, often hard. It's hard to say how one dissemination campaign directly reduces mortality. It's more like this will be something over time. But larger campaigns do measure these things when they've been around for years. And other types that, that they talk about as well as policy dissemination and so forth. So the take-home message for the dissemination work builds on what Ali was saying earlier. So be suspicious of demands for fidelity when the intervention is on behavior, complex organizations, or communities, because there's a need to be adaptive and flexible. Now, having said that, um, I, I know of examples personally in which that all is nice and good, but you may still end up with a section or a program officer within whatever institute you're at, and they will drive you to uh, for more um, demonstration of fidelity. So it's, uh, it, um, depending on where you're working, you might have to argue more or, or less. They may already be believers of this or not. The example I'll give is I was involved with, uh, we have an oral health disparity center, and they, they're trying to implement ways to get um, fluoride varnish out into Native American communities easily. So there's evidence that shows that fluoride is good for treatment cavities or prevention cavities, I should say. Um, and so the more you try and make it the increased fidelity of how are you going to do the education modules, et cetera, the more it becomes more like an efficacy trial. And that becomes very difficult to try and implement on a, a large uh, reservation that may be the size of West Virginia, right? So it, there's this balance between reach and scope and scalability and having things perfectly, you know, fidelity throughout the whole thing. And that's the natural tension. Um, and when you're designing the work, um, that's why it's important to draw evidence from practitioners, patients, the organizations in which you will hope that your intervention will be adopted or adapted. And related to the fidelity question is that try to identify the core elements of these interventions that really need to be where we focus the fidelity on, such that um, the folks adopting can adapt as necessary the other pieces. And that's not always very easy. Um, and the other piece, these are, I would say, process measures that are often important as you're thinking about implementation. Um, because at the end of the day, you're trying to say, well, what was it that I disseminated? And that's the duration of your message, the strength, the intensity, the context, the frequency. These are all measures that sometimes, um, you know, can get lost in the doing of it, and you wish at the end you were tracking along the way. So making sure that you remember to track along the way. Okay? So the last uh, 10 minutes or so are what they uh, encapsulated as uh, research funding opportunities. Now, I'll caveat this. This was um, Gene Mike a year ago, 2011. Since then, um, PCORI, the Patient Center Outcomes Research Institute, has also embraced the area of communication. Um, and so I've added those in there. And the other piece I'll be mentioning is our own um, CTFA, the Colorado Clinical Translation Clinic Institute. CCTFI um, is doing uh, its competitive renewal, and that is going in and um, embedded, if you will, dissemination implementation methods into the mix of methods that they are supporting. So I'll talk a little bit about that, which is new. So how many are aware of, of the NIH at the Dissemination Implementation Research and Health um, open announcement? Have any of you applied or received funding through this mechanism at all? Okay. Um, it's, it's been around for a while, so these numbers here correspond if it's an R21 or R01. Um, many different of the institutes uh, are, um, are supporting it, and there's a, importantly a standing um, scientific review committee, right? So it's made up of people who do dissemination implementation research, who are familiar with mixed methods, who are familiar with the questions and the issues that we've been talking about. So that's a good thing. 
Um, and in fact, um, you may not know that the new dean of schools of public health, Cody Goff, is the outgoing chair of this committee or study section. And he'll be speaking later in the spring, um, hopefully with some inside tips for us all. Um, and the essence of this program announcement is to look at effective and efficient strategies for both either dissemination or implementation. And it's really driving you towards practical trial um, intervention type studies that are in efforts to improve um, health services delivery in your public health or clinical practice. So the focus is very much on um, are you going to do a trial that might compare two different intervention strategies for implementation or dissemination on a large scale in order to address their public health problems? I just, I'm just so excited. I just got funding for an R21 in this mechanism. And so what we're looking at, for example, is um, trying to come up with the right strategies to address barriers, as I said, in diabetes and dyslipidemia screening among persons with serious mental illness. So I had, I had ideas around methods and things I wanted to do, but I needed to frame what I was doing moving towards an R1 that would allow us to compare different methods. So there's strength there, but it, you, you have to have some focus. So I mentioned CTSA funding. Many uh, medical schools have that. Some of them have um, an implementation, dissemination, orientation, although I would say not all. So I think um, looking at the CTSA, I think what we have here is somewhat unique which is a nice thing. And this gives you a conceptual framework of how we're thinking of the practical trial dissemination implementation program that we have proposed within our own renewal in which you clearly see dissemination implementation as being part of the program that goes from evidence synthesis, generation, and then the translation side. And the importance of really working with community and stakeholders um, throughout that process. So if we are funded, that gives us a, a, a larger, um, larger resources. And in fact, Chris of the center is going to be working synergistically there. So um, we're hopeful that we'll be putting on a, a one-day mini workshop, kind of like this one, but for um, folks here locally. Other funding opportunities that are listed, um, one, um, one was translational research in diabetes and obesity including the Centers for Diabetes Translational Research. And um, Julie Marshall is here from that center. This, um, the, um, the PI here is um, Theo Manson. And this is, we have one of the centers here locally, national centers here locally. And it's the Center for American Indian and Alaska Native Diabetes Translational Research. Um, ARC um, also funds R18, looking at implementation and change strategies. And we've had experience getting those funded as well here on campus. Um, the CDC also has prevention research centers and programs. And then I've added in more recently PCORI. Um, so if you go to PCORI.org, they have their program announcements on our phase. And they are focusing on these um, priority areas, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, thinking about healthcare system delivery, they call it communication and dissemination research specifically, so they're focusing on how do you take the knowledge and, and share it, um, looking at disparities, and they've just announced some uh, methodological research in the area as well. So a number of agencies um, are now um, more or less funded in this area. And um, Russ Glasgow and his colleagues at NIH wrote an article that came out in American Journal of Public Health last summer really making the case that we should be investing even more in dissemination and implementation research. Um, because if you think about the trees the falling in the forest, did it ever really happen? If we create all this evidence on how to do healthcare better, but we don't invest in the dissemination and translation, then we're not really getting a full return on our scientific investment, was the argument he made. And opportunities to advance the field are questions that relate to scaling up. How do we best scale up interventions that may be done in a state, in a system, more nationally? There's very little evidence on how do you think about this rollout, if you will, a campaign. We demonstrate it here and it works. How do you now campaign it nationally? And how do you think about it in terms of sustainability? That's another area where there's a lot of unmet need in terms of method and research knowledge. 
um, question, other areas that they suggest in this conference that you could focus on to enhance dissemination implementation um, is thinking about questions related to rigor and relevance and how you think of design. Um, how might you utilize existing data sets and databases to increase the efficiency and the speed by which we do dissemination implementation? I think this is where it starts to overlap a bit with quality improvement efforts. You know, they're, they're very much about rapid cycle learning. So how do you bring the science from doing that to that environment where they're trying to do rapid cycle learning? And in that way, it's, it's having to bring the scientists of dissemination in, in contact with the, the team, it's a team science, right? It's healthcare, it's economists, it's the stakeholders. How do you create that collaborative work environment? Um, and there's a number of activities going on, recognizing the need for this work to improve capacity, various training grants um, as, as well, and um, now getting cumulative or archival knowledge. This would be textbooks in, um, on the topic as well as journals and limitation science. So um, those are all areas um, if you're looking for more information to go. So that, in a nutshell, were sort of the broad thematic areas that were addressed in this institute um, that the NIH had to essentially, they're seeding the research community and bringing people in interested in this and sparking creativity such that they are coming back in the of the brain. So you've made the last few minutes. Is there questions or areas of interest that you'd like to see more on in future seminars or training workshops? We're open to ideas. Yes. Hi, my name is Taylor. It's very nice to meet um, I have two specific barriers that I run into that I would love to hear your guys' comments on. One is um, concerns posed by human subject protection rules and actually having to integrate consenting into clinical practices in order to be able to disseminate the findings. Um, you know, you've been creative in different